that you have at some point looked at birds flying past and thought I'd really like to get some good photos of you. But it's not that easy. It's something that I found very difficult. Well I did until March last year when I experienced a bit of a revolution, a mirrorless one. I became interested in bird watching when I was seven years old with the I Spy Book of Birds and almost straight away I wanted to take photos of birds, particularly birds in flight. However, I didn't have the gear. At university I became more interested in photography and my first camera was a Yashica 124G medium format twin lens looked down the top. This was not a good tool for photographing birds in flight or any wildlife for that matter. I progressed. My first SLR was a Sigma. It was a really nice camera with lots of features, but the autofocus was horrific, absolutely appalling. I used this camera for a while and eventually made the jump to digital, choosing the Canon system. I started off with a 350D and I progressed in that system to the 7D Mark II. And while things were getting better, in terms of birds in flight, not that much better. There are certain circumstances that I could use to allow me to photograph birds in flight. Basically, when the bird was actually flying, but pretty much still. I'll go into that later in the film. Back in the early part of last year, I bought the Canon R6. And I have to say, it's completely revolutionise the way I take photos of birds in flight and I think there's a few tricks that this camera has that means that anybody can get really good flight images. So this is the first of a series of videos I'll be doing where I'll be looking at how to make the most of the modern mirrorless camera. The first thing to do when you get your camera is to get it set up. You need to do this at home, there's no point trying to do this in the field. And this really involves customising the buttons and dials. I once worked out how many options there are for the Canon R6. It turns out there's around 100,000 options, different configurations of buttons and dials for this camera. About 100,000 for every grain of sand on earth. There are limitless, near limitless possibilities. And this is how I've got mine set up. You can alter the, the dials and buttons by going into Q and selecting this tab here. You then have a decision to make. Do you want to start off doing buttons or dials? I'm going to start off doing buttons. You can then go through each of the options and choose what you want that button to do. So the first button I have is this one. This is the the one that sets off the autofocus, but not the eye focus, not the eye animal tracking. It's a handy place, so I use this one. This is the sort of conventional back button focusing. Now rather than just doing back button focusing, I do a mixture of back and front button focusing. But what I use is the depth of field button is the button I use for the eye tracking. So typically if a bird's flying towards me, I'll lock onto it by pressing the button at the back. Once I'm quite happy that the bird's getting a bit larger in the frame, I'll then click the eye animal autofocus on and carry on from there. So I'll switch between the two. I have one at the front and one at the back for a couple of reasons. One is so they're separate. There's no chance of mixing the two up. They're in completely different places on the camera. Also, quite often I do photograph from car windows. And you're in a very hunched position with a, the sort of camera at a funny angle to your face. And I find it very difficult to engage the button at the back of the camera. Whereas I can very easily engage the, the depth of field button on the front of the camera. I find this to be really quite handy. Next to this, I have a button which I simply use to change the drive mode. One of the problems with this camera, especially if you have it in um, electronic shutter, 
is you can very quickly, without a space, if you suddenly decide that you're going to be taking some landscapes, then you don't want to be firing away at 20 frames per second. You want to have it on a uh, timer mode, so it's a sort of two second then fires. Now the quickest way to do that is to give it a dedicated button, which is what I've done here. Across from this button, the last one in the row, I have set it up to allow me to switch between focus modes for the other button on the back. This is a little bit complicated to set up. So I press this and then I can toggle between spot focus and a sort of a wide area focus. The reason for that is if you're trying to photograph a bird that's sort of flying towards you and there's relatively little else in the screen, you want wide area focus. If you then track that bird all the way in and it lands in a bush or in another group of birds, the wide area focus will just start going crazy. It will be aiming for twigs or different birds. It will be going for the wrong place. So very quickly you can then switch to spot focus and be able to select the exact target that you're looking to, looking to photograph. Now I'll just run through quickly how you set it up to limit the number of focus modes that you have available to you. This basically means that it's quicker, you don't have to toggle through as many. So you go through the, the menu, you select this option and then it's just simply a case of selecting which ones you want to turn on or off. It's a, a quick easy one, but it'll save you time in the field when you really need it. Finally on buttons, the little joystick on the back, I have that set up so that I can use it to toggle between points for the um, spot focus. So you can quickly change into spot and you can be using that to position exactly where you want it to be. So after you've set the buttons up as you want them, the next thing I would recommend you do is to set the dials up. Now I have quite a strange way of doing this and it makes sense to me. Part of the reason for this is I'm a big fan of manual. In fact, when it comes to the, the big dial on the top, mine is either in manual or it's in the filming. I never use any of the other modes ever. I should probably use custom functions, but it's so quick to change things on the camera. I don't really get around to it. I don't see the point. Because I'm in manual, I have them set up like this. Prior to having the, this camera, I always used to have it in AV mode. The reason being, you could, you could adjust it, you could put compensation in, but AV generally worked-ish, and I was never that confident in manual. I wish I was confident in manual. There were some hero photographers who had used manual for birds in flight all the time. I just didn't have the guts. Now, I've got a histogram. I've got a, the ability to look through the viewfinder and see what the camera's seeing, so I can make changes exactly as I want them. I can be following a bird while I'm getting the histogram in exactly the right position. It, it's absolutely revolutionary. So because I used to always be in AV mode, it's fairly logical that that's the, the thing that's going to be the, the decision I make and don't change. So this dial I find to be the, the one that's hardest to change on the go. So I set the aperture using this and then I, I tend not to mess around with it. The next thing I will set is the shutter speed. Now I've set this dial up for the shutter speed. This is quite quick to get to and I can make adjustments but generally I'm fairly set on the shutter speed I want. If it's something like the Seagull, probably 1600th of a second. And I'm not going to compromise that unless I really have to. So on the back, I use this dial, which is the easiest for me to use, the one I can change the quickest. I actually use this to set the ISO. Now, the ISO basically, to me now, means sensitivity. And because it's so good at high ISOs, I actually use this 
I use the sensitivity to effectively get the exposure right until it starts creeping up too high. Once it gets to, I don't know, depends on the situation, once it gets to sort of above 3000, I'll start maybe knocking the shutter speed down a little bit. And then as it keeps getting higher, I'll then maybe start thinking about knocking the aperture down if I can't use the shutter speed anymore. But this is a really powerful tool because you can react incredibly quickly to situations. And with birds in flight, a bird you're tracking can suddenly fly into a dark area. It can suddenly fly onto a light background or a dark background. All these are going to mess up the, car the camera if it's trying to do the job itself. But you can actually see these things happening. Now, I'm afraid the best example I have of why this is such a useful tool in terms of manual exposure and being able to react quickly actually came whilst lying on a swim panel about six inches from the, the surface of the sea photographing orcs at low level. I suddenly realised there were a group of orcs very close to me but I was looking straight into the sun and by this I mean it was early morning, an absolutely flat calm sea and I was looking directly at the sun. It was incredibly bright. Now if I'd have left this to the camera it would have ended up going for a massively high um, shutter speed and it would have ended up with a grey sea and a black silhouetted orc. Now I wasn't interested in the sea, I was looking for a really sort of high key image. So I got onto the orcs and bear in mind this was on a moving boat, it wasn't very easy. And I quickly adjusted the shutter speed and the ISO so it was focused on the shadows. The sea was completely blown out and if I'd have left it to like aperture priority and then dialed in compensation I'd probably be looking at dialing in maybe you know three four five stops of compensation so being able to just get onto it gave me this shot here and I love it I think it's a really interesting shot so it's that ability to react to be able to choose what you want rather than let the Canon the Canon Canon R6, the camera, decide for you. I think it's such a useful tool. Once you've got the camera set up, the next thing you need to do, before you actually go out into the field and actually try and take bird images in flight, you need to get used to the camera. When you sat in front of the TV watching some mindless dribble, or in front of YouTube watching me talking some mindless dribble, have the camera in your hand just practice, practice it, practice again, so that when the adrenaline is flowing, when you've got that amazing experience happening in front of you, you can very quickly get the camera set up as you want it. You can be from landscape mode into bird in flight mode on this camera in two or three seconds, excluding changing the lens. But you really need to be able to know exactly how to check the histogram, how to change things in the menu, how to alter the, the exposure, how to alter the ISO. You know, you need to be able to do that without thinking about it. So while you start talking to people, now just be playing with the camera, just be practicing moving through the dials. This is probably the biggest tip I can give you. So once everything's set up, the next thing you need to do is to photograph something easy to sort of start off and just practice getting your hand in and getting used to it. I decided to have a go with um, some dogs. Now the owners were very nice to me, they were happy to throw the ball to me and have the dogs sprint at me so I could practice using the, the animal eye tracking and I thought this would go quite well. What I actually came up with was image after image of sharp photos. So I upped the ante and got them to start throwing the ball high so the dogs would be bouncing around and jumping and leaping all over the place. And there was one shot I particularly liked, and that's this one. I have to say, when I saw it, I felt just as smug as this dog looks. 
The next place I went to was the Icon Estuary. Now, if you're going to start doing birds in flight, the best thing to do is to go to somewhere that's good and you're going to get steady supply of birds flying past you. Preferably nice ones that you're looking to get images of. What I would suggest that you do is look for somewhere where you can position yourself between like a seabird colony and the sea or close to cliffs on somewhere like uh, somewhere like Bempton if you're down in sort of Yorkshire you know one of these places where there's thousands of birds then you can start practicing because you're going to get another chance if you mess up so this is my chosen spot this is the Ithan Estuary this is an overhead view here you'll see this area is the the main turn colony from the turn colony there's a, a narrow estuary that heads to the sea and the terns breed at the colony and then either fish in the estuary a lot of them do or they use this as a motorway to get to the sea and the feeding grounds so you have sandwich arctic and common terns going past all the time and you can also get lucky and manage to photograph little turns so it's a, a really good place just to just to practice and actually more than practice get some really nice photos there's also like to be eiders flying past and a wide range of other birds and if you get bored of birds then there are plenty of seals to photograph as well and if you're there in the spring particularly in may keep an eye out for elvis the king eider there's been a male king eider at this estuary now for many 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 years and he's a a bit of a star so i've gone through how to get everything set up and now it's over to over to you to go and have a go yourself now the next video in this series will actually include a trip to the Athen estuary to see how i got on and go through the photos and one difference you'll find between my video and most you see is normally they will show you one or two images that they've got that are perfect have been cropped i tend to show the whole sequence so you may as well see all the ones where the wings are clipped as well just to see how many photos you're likely to take to get those really good images so it probably won't be my next video on the channel because i've got a few other things i'm working on as well but probably in the next month or six weeks i'll have the next of the bird in flight videos out if you enjoyed that and found it at all useful please subscribe it's really useful for me to, and uh, a good way of growing the channel so more people can see it I hope you get out there and enjoy using your camera and if you do please put comments below and I'd love to see some of your photos I'm on Facebook so you can send them to me there you in here wildlife and yeah get in touch I'm always happy to give out tips and advice thank you so much for watching see you next time